Hello world. Today I'm going to walk through some uh, documents that I posted, which I drew on paper and uh, then put on the internet and people can't read them. That's fine. Um, I'm going to walk through it. Eventually I'll clean this up and put it into a more formal presentation, but for now this is what I have. Now notice the push pin. There's a reason for that. Um, Peter Van Hardenberg has a system called Pushpin, which is uh, quite amazing. Uh, think of it as your own personal notebook for taking notes and uh, pasting uh, whatever you want into it. And um, I've used it. It's uh, actively under development, so check it out. Um, but the, this is long-term thinking, um, just based on my experience of what I would want and what based on some ideas about Ted Nelson that I researched. So on my PC I want to have private areas and public areas and consider these like websites or um, applications that I build um, and in um, Beaker browser currently there is that concept a private hyperdrive and public hyperdrives so it's all based on private and public key cryptography. Um, so like my work in progress would be in private and when I publish it, it would be in a public hyperdrive that um, if people know how to get to me with this hyper address, they can get it directly from my machine when I'm on or the long-term solution is to have a pinning service such as dat dot. So what I want to be able to do is to periodically publish my work in progress because like I was working on a song and it had five revisions. So I did revisions one, two, and three. I want to be able to send it th over time to an official repository, which is really just a replicated copy of my hyperdrive. So I would think of it like a GitHub fork. So like, uh, this would be forking from my hyperdrive and um, like getting the latest. So there's a curation process to update an official copy. So say you had like three people working on something, um, you know, there's some need for some workflow there. Okay, but I'm looking at dat dot as uh, cloud storage outside of corporate uh, interests. So now in terms of organization of my work, um, I want definitely versions and uh, directories, uh, but I like the idea of Ted Nelson's tumblers where um, everything about documents is always stored. It's always append only, which is like a hypercore. So like um, here's a hyperdrive of tumblers and EDLs. That's an edit decision list. So I like the model of Xanadu Cambridge, which Ted Nelson demonstrates, where people can uh, create an EDL, it pulls in content, they can edit their EDL, so it could be like a personal EDL that they can then share with people. Now sharing would be done through a web of trust with whatever encryption, the noise that can be implemented easily for people. Now, so like in my music example, I published versions one through three, and then version four, I changed the name of the song, and then version five, I went back to the original name. So like if you're trying to index that, um, you would, they, they really are logically the same song, but um, yeah, you want, so what a Tumblr directory structure gives you, it's like in a numeric outline, like 1.2, 1.2.1, 1.2.1.1, .1 uh, to whatever level of depth you need. So um, like this could have been a 3.1, a 3.2. So, um, uh, so Ted describes this in his book, Literary Machines, in detail. So... I feel like uh, the concepts can be reused. He also talks about enfilade theory. Um, so he was thinking about like hard disk drives and how you would locate material. And it's always uh, appending and keeping pointers intact. So there are 
other ways of doing this now in a network operating system like the DAT protocol. So, you see, the point was he wanted a, a permanent address. So, like, the permanent address for version 3 is my hyper feed address and a directory, which is like a tumbler. You could just keep adding subdirectories as much as you can. And uh, so it's the EDL that would reconstruct what you need. So like say I'm pulling um, you know, some bytes from version three, bytes from version five, like maybe version one had most of everything. Version two is an EDL where I change one part of the text. Okay, now what I'd also like to see is a smart contract that can give me a time lock or a time capsule. So when my private files get published publicly, if anything happens to me, uh, or like if I estimate 50 years from now, I have some private things that I don't want published in my lifetime. I want that to be possible where I can... Um, in order to implement that, you need a reliable clock source. So let's see. Um, local network, XANA viewers, prototype, and A-B test the interfaces. Yeah, I mean, that's what would be required to build something. Now, the point of that is some um, applications can be customized for different user communities and needs. So. Um, it, think of it in, like accessibility, it's like maybe text needs to be read aloud with a screen reader. So that would be a new application running on the same data. So the DAT is only data, and that's what DAT dot is sharing in a manner that you can be assured, like a public cloud, that it is stored, because smart contracts are enforcing that the people hosting these are storing it and that um, it is uh, being delivered. So then that is a, a, a disincentive for bad actors in that uh, ecosystem. So dat dot would serve my hyper feed as a CDN. So, um, okay. So when a user would connect to my feed, it's the same address, um, they could download all or part of my hyperdrive. And if we have the block addressing and inode maps in there, then it is possible to calculate the segments of the hypercore that would be needed. So essentially the tumblers are, so you, they would first like download a table of contents, which is an EDL, edit decision list, and that that they would be able to know which tumblers need to be retrieved and that mapping of the tumblers to the inodes or whatever physical storage is built would allow them to get what they want. So as an example, um, this uh, KMDMP is a notation for an archive piece of music that I worked on. So I would have different um, it, so that the, the files that represent that evolved over time. Um, eventually I have a digitized notation file and it's a tumbler, which is like just a dotted list of uh, decimal numbers. But uh, just as an example, um, say like this .40.10.1 is my latest version, .2 is older versions. So like I could do like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3 1 for successive versions, but the numbering scheme is <clears throat> up to the application. But um, so, yeah, let, let's just look at what else. So once I digitized the tune, I then arranged it a C part and a B flat part. So I call these bandstand scores. That's what the project I'm working on calls them. Uh, their PDF files. So think about the problem of version control in music. Like say you arrange a piece, you give it to a band, and then you realize, oh, I made some mistakes, I got to clean that up, and I should fix this part, and then rebuild these, uh, you know, re-extract the parts from the score. 
um, it's a complicated version control system. And if you were just using files and naming them dot one, dot two, dot three, <laughs> you go crazy trying to figure out what to do. So like for now, what I've done until I have a system like this is I um, have directories. So for now, what I've done, um, th this is like my work in progress. Uh, and uh, th these are the files that I uploaded. Um, like this is a music score file and a PDF. And I uploaded this on June 27th at 5 a.m. So this is uh, my attempt at version control just using directories. And then the bandstand score parts are here. So if I have edit that, I'd have to create subdirectories for versions. So you can see how messy it can get. Okay, um, but thinking about, let's just go back to this. So in my personal um, drive, when I'm building this, like there's this piece I'm working on, and there are original source photos of the music, because this comes from a library in the Ukraine. Um, then there are notebook entries by Moshe Beregovsky describing what he knew about these pieces when he looked at the notebook. And then there's a tracking spreadsheet of metadata, which is being maintained in a Google spreadsheet that people are editing. So yeah, that's what we have currently. Um, but like maybe I want my own like fork of that spreadsheet, some private notes and some public notes and uh, like maybe I'm not sure about something right away, so I wanna keep it private until I do more research. And then the, the 40 came from all the files related to my work on the piece, so my original and derived files. So like um, I use a software called LilyPond where you could take a text file and it converts it into a PDF of music notation. Yeah, so the source file, the L Lily Pond is related to the PDFs and now it does XML. So I want to know that um, this PDF was derived from this source. Okay, so maybe under the Tumblr for dot 40, I would have uh, like 10 is the published PDF, 20 is the music XML file, 30 is the music score file. So really by application, this structure would be defined. Okay, and then uh, I do a Facebook post about the piece. Well, how do you track things on Facebook, connect them to your work, your files, your GitHub? It's messy. Well, let's say I have an EDL. So here I have uh, like a link, a XANA link between my Tumblr for my notation files and an EDL that points to that Facebook post, okay? So that I can bring that in when I need to reference it because trying to find something on Facebook after a week, uh, it's crazy. Okay, and then my derived works. So like once I notate the piece, yeah, the band scan score is one derivative work, but I could have videos of my rehearsals and performances of the piece. So like, um, the video I put up yesterday of me playing that song while sitting at that piano, I uh, went through maybe 10 times of playing it and, uh, just to, before I got a version that I liked. And uh, you'll hear all the mistakes. Maybe somebody's interested in seeing that, uh, what kind of mistakes I made practicing a new piece. And maybe they're teaching piano. They want to know a sample student. Of what. Okay, so like here, EDL to my video. Yeah, so like if I was playing it on the clarinet, I would want to link the B flat score to the video of me playing that. So like maybe the yeah dot, the videos could be dot seventy and dot eighty, but it is possible to have a timeline in this Tumblr structure, and it could be a timeline where you could insert in the future you at any point where you can uh, restructure easily. And maybe the enfilade would help with that. But uh, the point is keep everything always um, in your hyper drives, your hyper cores, and uh, allow it, allow dat dot to serve it, but um, use webs of trust. 
so so say I only want to share it with two people, I would um, if I could encrypt everything um, and create a hyperdrive where just those people have access um, to the encrypted version and um, they can um, it can be re-encrypted with their public keys. So that's what I want people to think creative about. So eventually the point is there is no authoritative source. Only curated hyperdrives with user-created links, XANA links, that people can follow to make up their own minds based on their personal trust models. So say Alice, Bob, and Carol are a small group Maybe they're working on music, um, but this is the Venn diagram of what they know about each other and their work. So this number one, only Alice knows certain piece of information. Like maybe she just downloaded something from a library archive and Bob and Carol don't know about it yet. But then she shares that with Bob, but not Carol. So that's this area. And then Bob has some private info that uh, he's not ready to share yet, but he's working on it. Um, and then four is Alice and Carol, but not Bob. Now this five is the group commons. So right now that could be a Google Drive, a Google spreadsheet, and uh, maybe they're all contributing to it. But um, what should a commons be? Well, if this is a web of trust, a file sharing network, and they're internationally distributed, uh, dat dot can support that um, if they do encryption on top of their hyperdrives. So it's it, that, that private public concept of public hyperdrive for all three or anyone else they invite in the group later would um, be a web of trust where it could be rekeyed if uh, Bob has to get out of the group and Alice and Carol don't trust them anymore, they should be able to rekey anything forward, uh, perfect forward secrecy. Okay, so Alice and Carol, but not Bob, um, the group commons. So no number six is Bob and Carol, but not Alice. And seven is Carol's private hyperdrives. And maybe they are time locked with a smart contract to publish after a specific date or a specific condition with a reliable network time source. So, I mean, that's going to be important. Um, people need the confidence that they can put things up in the cloud and no one can read them until they decide they're ready to publish them or, or they die or something. Uh, yeah, time lock. Okay, so now eight is outside info that the group doesn't know. So maybe all their communications are being recorded by the government. Oh, they're doing a conspiracy. No. Um, so, the, the, yeah, so there's a blind self. In a way, I look at this as like, um, you know, the, your public self, your blind self, your hidden self from psychology. Okay, but that is a fact of the system that uh, they don't know they're being spied on. Okay, so, uh, but that could be represented like the government hyperdrive, their dossier on these three guys, three people. <laughs> okay, but I also like to think of this in terms of sense making. So we can't trust our media anymore. So like media source one says that this is a conspiracy theory, whatever media source two reported and media source two says, oh no, that, that's fake news. Well, who do you believe? Well, each, pe each person has to make up their own mind these days. So like Alice gets her feed from Media Source One, and she believes it's a conspiracy theory. Um, Bob gets his feed. Oh no, don't trust Media Source One. They, they send out fake news. So that's Bob's belief. But whatever little communication they have here, that's where that could either enlarge or shrink based on Alice and Bob's trust for each other and their discussions. Now, how do they make their case to each other? Well, they have to do their own research. They need supporting evidence. And where's that going to come from? Other fake news sources on the internet? Uh, other crazy stuff out there? Or will you have hyper-publishers? 
Maybe you have an inside source in a country that Alice knows, a friend in a country that's undergoing uh, you know, political change, and maybe she can get supporting evidence, keep it private, but disclose what she needs to to Bob to open up a little bit of that communication, but not the whole thing. And maybe she has a feed where a hyper publisher or blogger publishes updates. And this is also part of a web of trust. Um, I mean, if it's public, they publish an open hyperdrive. Okay. But now Bob has to justify why I think so, why I think that Source One is sending fake news. Well, he may have a private hyperdrive where he starts working on that. Why I think so, maybe just his own commentary of his experience, his story, what makes him think that. But then maybe he finds some evidence. But, I mean, it's the same thing. It's all about triangulating your sources and uh, you're having multiple sources of information. But if Bob shares a little of that in this area, Alice would be able to then look through the whole um, tree that's shared and see all the sources. So maybe Bob is writing an essay and he says, well, I found this on Russia Today. And uh, then it has a transclusion of that, uh, maybe a paragraph of that article. Now think about what you have now. If you want to read an article, um, you get ads popping up all over the place and uh, you're scared that, uh, is it a real site? Is there JavaScript that's going to do something harmful? Yeah, well, you still have that unless, uh, you know, see, it's all about trust, which we've lost. The early internet was assuming a certain level of trust. But see, um, essentially people are building their folksonomies um, there. Okay. So like another example, a folksonomy is not authoritative. Well, you think Wikipedia is authoritative? Uh, ask a high school teacher. Um, it's just available for personal sense making and judgment. So, I mean, that's going to be the key going forward. Everybody having their personal way of making sense of the information that's shoved at them. And, uh, yeah, so this process of adapt, yeah, really expressing yourself, people cannot express themselves easily these days. Um, yeah, so pr under areas of censorship, um, so being able to have a private area that you can share a little bit with a trusted network and then more over time, um, and maybe his thinking changes Maybe after talking with Alice a lot, he starts looking at her sources and um, you know, makes up his own mind that, okay, I, that I wasn't this guy, I, I can't trust him anymore, but uh, yeah, I could maybe look at this one. So that's what we need. Um, the abil information availability, and that's an objective of dot dot. Now let's look at a, how this can be taken in the future. So Ted Nelson designed a zigzag database system. Think of it as a spreadsheet where you could insert data between cells and um, it has multiple dimensions. So you can rotate in various dimensions and see your cells rearrange themselves on the screen to uh, makes sense in that dimension. And it's all orthogonal, which means right angles. So with uh, 3D web software these days, you can show a 3D structure easily in OpenGL. Um, it's uh, it, it, just using XML, you can show 3D. Now, what if you had a second monitor that renders the linked media on demand? So as you're navigating this and rotating in different dimensions, this other monitor um, would show the linked documents. Um, so um, Ted had a flight of documents with all the visible connections, uh, a lot of bridges. Um, when you have a lot of sources that can get unwieldy, but um, if the, 
I find that I like the zigzag uh, data structure model, but um, whatever is built, it requires some user experience um, analysis, um, really A-B testing. So um, rotate in any dimension on X, Y, or Z. Uh, Rank analysis means representations, or um, operations, methods, and controls. Uh, something I learned in college uh, for expert systems design and considering person's learning style, if it could be flexible for different types of learners, um, maybe different paths to follow. Okay, so um, Ted mentioned um, different ways of representing text. Um, the one that he mentions is a cylinder that uh, you, you could rotate and see like before and after, a little bit of before and after. Um, I came up with the Torah idea, where You have a scroll that you can rotate uh, to see more. And then you're seeing columns of text with Xanalinks going out or uh, coming in. And uh, Ted talks about the Talmud where you had Hebrew uh, text from the Bible and then commentaries about that text all around it. A parallel page. Um, but basically Xanadu space, the source code is available and I've looked at it a little bit. Um, it's hard but it's elegant. Um, but it's really um, emergent. The source code is just giving the tools for the structure to emerge. Um, with Zigzag is the database underneath Xanadu space. It renders the flight um, the, all the documents in the background and the current document you're looking at. It creates the tetroids, which are the paragraphs that are you're uh, connecting, and then it builds the bridges between the, the, to transclude between the source documents and the document you're looking at. Um, it has slabs in uh, OpenGL, which are like lips, thin rectangles, uh, thin boxes where it renders the text on top of it. So these are uh, visual aids that can be uh, evaluated. Okay, so curation and co-creation. Okay, let's look at this a little bit. Curation, self-selecting of opinions of your trust network. Nothing is discarded. Okay. And then co-curation. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is if people are curating and um, you have people collaborating on curating information, you should have a pull request model where like Alice, Bob, and Carol, um, that one of them finds something that they think is relevant to the topic under curation, they should be able to do a pull request to whoever's maintaining that curation. So um, pull requests are, um, it's from GitHub, but think of it as um, you're, you've read something and you're marking it up with a pencil and you want to give some feedback. Your feedback should always be connected to something in the document. Um, so if, say, Carol is the curator and Alice um, marks up something, so the markup is starts on our personal hyperdrive and then gets shared out with Carol first, and Carol can pull it in to the latest version of the document that she's working on. Now, there's concurrency issues that can be solved with timestamps, but... Uh, but see, you're tracking the versions, and uh, so like Ted was all about uh, yeah, editing online, where it tracks every change. Um, but now, yeah, if people are working offline. Yeah, th there are models that work, and uh, there are conflict resolution protocols. Okay, but let's see what else. Uh, Co-creation. Okay, so you have a personal web space, transclusion to others information, and you can fork 
and essentially you're building your own personal learning mountains. So I like to think of education like mountains, Mount JavaScript, Mount Rust, or whatever mountain, because um, it seems like whenever something new comes out, you have to read a thousand pages before you can do anything. <laughs> All right, so here is uh, somebody mentoring me on Mount JavaScript, throwing me down a rope, trying to pull me up to the next level. <laughs> uh, that's what I would like to see implemented in a decentralized educational system. And then, so here are people climbing Mount Rust. Maybe this person blazes a different path that, that can go around here and go up to the summit a different way. And uh, maybe they can uh, yeah, put that path in a living document and uh, under construction and maybe get some input from people lower. Hey, does this uh, help you understand this? And uh, maybe there could be co-creation. That person's got a great idea that they can do a pull request and this person could accept it or reject it. So that's the future of us collaborating together. And here we are on Earth. We've got some stuff in space on the ISS. Uh, space knowledge has fueled a lot of our learning, but how are we gonna get to Star Trek? where we have a starship, we have Zephyr and Cochrane, and then we have starships that are warping, exploring the galaxy. Well, you need somebody up here who climbed some mountains who can envision the future and blaze the trail. So you're blazing different paths, but who's gonna blaze the trail forward? And what does that person need? Well, in depending on where they live in the world these days, they need certain levels of protection of their ideas. Okay, so hopefully we can get to a continuous evolution for Earth and revolution, because that's sometimes what it takes to allow ideas to live. So what we're looking at, yeah, nothing is discarded. That's possible these days. We're looking at unwalled gardens, which Paul Frazee has talked about. Uh, you're not locked into a corporate app, custom and alternative presentation layers. Okay, so here is your dat data. <laughs> um, so you have connected uh, hyper drives, hyper cores on dat dot, which I believe is the correct future platform or storing storage management. Um, and I like the way that we're just biting off one problem at a time because we have wicked problems in the world. Uh, it, so I'm just laying out options. So think about options for 3D, virtual reality, augmented reality, and eventually holographic technology um, that can access this data and render it in different ways different experiences. That's more UX research. Um, but open up the imagination. Um, and the, to, the key is to separate data from presentation, the strict separation of your data structures. So people are all working on their own parts of the ecosystem. But if we could have a globally connected earth of communication, we have some hope. Thank you. So one more idea I want to talk about is trans copyright. So Ted Nelson has some videos that give a demo of it. So like say you follow a transclusion to a journal article and you, the source quoted one paragraph of that journal article. Well, if you wanted to read a little bit forward or backward in that article, you should be able to purchase just what you need, like uh, maybe down to the character. Yeah, I want to buy that little asterisk. <laughs> now, you can, uh, using micropayments, you should be able to buy you know, like a paragraph or um, a, a page. Now, it is possible, like with PDFs, to uh, separate out pages and serve them uh, individually. So that would make sense with our current uh, data in them. Um, but uh, it is uh, done through encryption. Um, the publisher would encrypt it 
with the key and then when somebody buys it um, they send the publisher their public key and then they receive the encrypted document that they could decrypt or whatever little piece of it and that could be done with hyperdrives or hypercores or whatever we imagine so I want us to be creative and think about how we can use what we know to create the world we need thank you